Welcome to July's Rock Game Dev Workshop, everyone. So glad you could join us. In case this is your first time tuning into Rock Game Dev Workshop, I'm Sam, Rock Game Dev's Workshop Coordinator. Rock, Ga Rock Game Dev is an organization dedicated to fostering a community of game creators in Rochester, New York. Our mission is to provide a local platform for game creators at beginning, amateur, and professional levels to learn, share, and collaborate in all aspects of building games. If you want more info, head over to rockgamedev.com. If you've got an idea for a workshop you'd like to give or a workshop you'd like to see, let me know. You can find me at Sam underscore Camerata on Discord and Sam Catamaran on Twitter. I'd love to hear whatever you uh, got on the brain. Which brings us to tonight's workshop, Helping Players Finish Your Jam Game. Our speaker, Aiden Markham, is the lead artist at Aesthetician Labs and a huge fan of game jams. As a lover of narrative games, he's been using game jams as a way to build an itch catalog of small, quirky stories. Because of this, he's been able to develop lots of tips and tricks to help players, exper to help players experience everything his games have to offer. Tonight's talk will share tips and tricks learned from the years of Aiden's jam experience to help players finish your game. Never again will you do poorly in ratings because players miss the amazing ending of your, game's, of your game's story. This talk assumes you have some level of experience with game development and aims to help you improve your design process. Some examples will be given in Unity C Sharp, but the, content, but the content of the talk can apply to games made in any engine. Feel free to drop any questions in chat as we go. And with that, I'll hand it over to you, Aiden. Good evening, everyone. This is my presentation, Helping Players Finish Your Game, uh, subtitled Getting Everyone Across the Finish Line. Uh, as with all my Rocket Game Dev workshops, if you'd like to open the slides to follow along on your own PC, or if you'd just like to see them later on, this link on screen here, bit.ly slash game finish workshop, will be the link to these slides. And once the video of this talk is archived, you'll be able to find that right here in the slide deck as well. Uh, so let's get right into it. First off, who am I? There's a picture of me, uh, part of Aesthetician Labs, as Sam said. You might know me best from the video game Crazy Plates, possibly also the video game Aquarial. That's my most recent jam game. Uh, and here's some links about where you can find me. Um, focus this tab here. All right, the problem, you're participating in a game jam. You've decided to make a narrative game because you like that kind of game. Uh, and you put all this work into your, your excellent ending sequence. You've got this cool end cut scene. You really poured your heart and soul into it. You package the game up and submit it and in the comments, it's clear that most players played your game and didn't even get to the end. They missed that excellent end sequence you put all that time into. This talk is about how to keep players on your game and avoid them falling out prematurely so that they can see all the content that you've created for them. So let's talk about that. The beginning, hooking the player. This is about the ways in which players might be driven away from your game in just the first minute or even just the first few seconds. Let's talk about one of the most important ones. They can't figure out how to play. Now, one of the things I love about jam games is that it's a place where really innovative experiences can shine um, because they're not under the pressure of market forces, people who participate in game jams are, are able to really try whatever they want. And that can lead to some really, really interesting um, experimental control schemes. But the problem with that situation is that they often can't rely on genre conventions. So for example, say you've just downloaded the, the latest new first person shooter game on your PC. It's the, the new hot thing. You're excited to get in there. If you're an experienced gamer already, even a little bit, you probably will be able to get up and running really quickly because you'll, you know, your your fingers will instinct instinctively go to W A S and D. Your mouse, your right hand will go right to the to the mouse, and you'll start to run around and use mouse look. You might also you know, decide you want to go a little faster, hold shift to sprint, control to crouch, maybe C to crouch, E to use, all that usual stuff. It's nice and easy for very standard genre games, but you don't always have that luxury with your jam game. And unless you give the player some way to 
know your controls, they might bounce off just because they can't figure it out. The most basic and one of the most common ways I see people get around this is simply listing out their controls in a big list on the game page. That's really easy to do, which I think is why so many people do it. And understandably, in a game jam, time is of the essence. And that's a really quick way to get your controls out there. But there's a couple reasons why that's not so good. So let's talk about some better solutions. First excellent solution, put your controls text in the game. Basically every game engine has the ability to set up a UI element, which can be toggled with a key on the keyboard. Instead of listing your, all your controls on the game page, consider taking that same text and placing it on a UI element. And then even on the, uh, on the game page, just, play, just put press escape in the game to view the controls. This has a few advantages. For one, you control the presentation of it. In a uh, game page controls list, it's, you're at the whim of the CSS of the website that you're working with. And also, the player has to leave your game. They have to alt tab. Maybe you didn't have time to put in a pause function, so the game is continuing on behind the scenes while they're reading your controls. With a, uh, a key press in game, they can check them instantly as many times as they want very easily. If you did put in a pause function, you could even automatically pause the game while they're, they're looking at the controls. This is a nice, simple way to help players to avoid that situation. The other way, and what I think is my favorite, is to simply show the controls at the beginning of the game. Now, this only works if your control scheme is relatively simple, which I generally try to keep as a rule for my games, I try to make sure that they're, they're reasonably simple. Almost all of them are played with WASD and the mouse. A few pitfalls with this though, it can be quite intrusive. Some people don't like that. Um, and yeah, like I said, it only works with simpler control schemes, but it ensures that people see them. Uh, when it's hidden behind a key press, some people might miss the little note on uh, the game page saying press escape to check the controls. Um, if you want to make sure that no one misses them, forcing them to look at them for a few seconds before they start the game is a great way to get around that. So that's how to solve the problem of people not being able to figure out how to play your game. The next problem, and this dovetails nicely from them not being able to figure out how to play, as you might be asking, well, what if I, what if I build a tutorial for my game? And the next issue is they might be annoyed by your tutorial. This is a common pitfall I see, especially with jam games from multiple people. Um, you'll sometimes start playing a jam game and get about five minutes in and realize you're still in the tutorial. And this can be a little bit frustrating because in game jams, there's generally an essentially unlimited supply of games to rate. And many of them incentivize you to rate as many as you possibly can. So usually you don't want to be bogged down by too much tutorialization. I think the best approach is player guided. The way I like to do teaching the players is show them the controls, as I said, and give them a safe area to mess around and figure it out. This is excellent because it's player guided. And what I mean by that is that if a player takes a little while to figure it out, they can sit there for five to 10 minutes if they need to and mess around with it. But maybe someone's seen a video of your game already. They kind of know what's happening and they just want to get started. They can leave the safe area right away. So it doesn't matter how long it takes them to learn how to use the controls of your game. They can simply move on whenever they're ready. And the final pitfall that you can run into in the beginning of your game is the players missed what makes it special. As I said, when people are rating jam games, they have essentially endless games to rate. There's a million. Ludum Dare, one of my favorite game jams, gets something like 4,000 entries each time, uh, far more than any one person could ever hope to play. And under that, that pressure, if people start playing the game and they aren't interested, if you don't hook them right in the beginning, they're really quite likely, I think, to just move right along after just a minute or two. 
to try and find something a little bit more interesting. And so I think the best way to avoid this is to try and figure out what's unique about your game. What's what makes you excited about it and try and show that to the player in whatever form you can within 90 seconds of them clicking play. An example I'd give is the two, my two most recent jam games or two of my most recent jam games, Aquarial and Aviarium, where you play as a fish and a bird respectively. In those games, the special part is that you get to be a fish and a bird. And so in both of those games, I make sure that the player learns how to swim or they learn how to fly right away, right in the beginning of the game. And if you show them that really early on, they might be likely to stick around through the beginning and make it to the middle, the section of the game where you really need to keep them on the line. Once a player is through those first few minutes of the game, I, I find there's a much higher chance they'll make it to the end. At least when I've made it through the first three minutes of a game, I'm personally much more likely to have that be one of the games that I'm going to sit there and play for 15 to 30 minutes. Um, it's not that frequent that I sit down and play a game for only four or five minutes, unless it's a game that only has that much gameplay, that much content. So let's talk about some of the reasons why people might get pushed away in the middle of your game. They got stuck. Now, this is one of the most frustrating things that I see happen on a very regular basis in jam games. I'll be playing be making good progress sometimes it's quite a difficult game as well um and it was a lot of work and skill to get as far as i did in the game and i realized that whether it's due to a bug or unforeseen circumstances or some other situation i, I can't progress like i've fallen in a hole that's too deep for me to jump out of or i've somehow clipped into the game's geometry and i, I simply can't move on a lot of times I might be 10 minutes deep in the game already. And now the only way for me to progress is to restart the game and start again from the beginning. And in that case, I'm likely to stop playing and grade the game based on what I've seen so far. Luckily, I think more than the other one, there's, there's so many solutions to this problem with various levels of, of efficacy. The first one being just add a restart button to your game. As you can see here, I got a little code snippet uh, for a restart button uh, and a little image here of one that I've implemented before. All this really does is it reloads the scene that the game is happening in. This is not much better than them being forced to press Alt F4, exit out of your game and restart from the beginning, but it's better for a few reasons. One is that you avoid them being tempted by other games in their library because they stay in the game. They click restart, they're right back in the beginning. If they have to close their game or your game, often what they'll be faced with is a folder full of jam games they've downloaded to play. And they have to make the decision whether to go back in and play a section of your game that they've already played or move on to something new, which could potentially be fresh and interesting. So a restart button at least just doesn't even give them the opportunity. You can also perhaps skip any intro cutscenes or tutorials your game might have. I distinctly remember one jam game I played a couple of years ago that was quite buggy, but the game was quite short, so it wouldn't have been too big of an issue, except for the fact that the game had a 45 second intro cutscene. And it was fun the first time. It's kind of campy. It was like voice acting on a headset mic, the kind of thing I usually love. But after I had seen it the sixth time that it required for me to finish the game, I was, I was done with that unskippable 45 second cutscene. So with a restart button, you could skip them to after the cutscene and just put them right back at the beginning of the game. That might solve a few problems. Uh, the next thing, which I think is maybe the next best solution is uh is a stuck button of sorts there's a few ways to approach this and it, this is really quite bespoke to the kind of game that you're making 
But a few examples of what these do are often teleporting the player to a safe location. Like if your game takes place into in a relatively small game map, maybe they fall through the floor. Instead of forcing them to restart the whole game, just give them the ability to teleport right back to the center of the map. If you have a bug where the player gets stuck in the ground super frequently, consider the stuck button just shifting them up a couple game units uh, so that they then take a short fall, but then they're back above the ground. I've even seen games that have uh, particularly buggy colliders give you no clip for just a few seconds. It is important to note, though, that this uh, solution has the potential for abuse. Um, a good rule of thumb is that even if it's not the most fun way, players will always choose the most effective way to get through your game. So say you give them the ability to, to shift up to get unstuck. If they can hit that repeatedly, then you've essentially given them an unlimited jump key. So you might consider adding a cooldown on this kind of thing. Make it so that they can only click it once every 10 seconds or something like that. That said, if it can free a player from having to restart your entire game, this could definitely keep someone on track to finish and not going off to play the next game. And finally, I think this is maybe the gold standard for this kind of situation would be to add checkpoints of some kind. This is a little more technically complicated, but at its simplest, it's essentially a collider that changes the player's spawn point every time they touch it. Uh, that means that you can simply respawn the player, kill them, and they'll just show up a little bit later in the game. This one is really nice because it's also good for player experience outside of them getting stuck. Um, it can allow you to make your game much more challenging if the player loses less progress when they die or lose. A classic example of this, I think, is the platforming game Celeste, uh, which I really love. Um, it has a checkpoint essentially at the beginning of every screen, and each screen only takes a few seconds to go through. The game can be viciously difficult because of the fact that if you lose, you've only ever lost 10 to 15 seconds of progress. Um, if you had to play through entire levels without dying, like the old Mario games, uh, as checkpoints pictured here, uh, where there's maybe one checkpoint a level or no checkpoints a level, it would be near impossible to complete. It's near impossible to complete already with the uh, very frequent checkpoints. So especially... If you want to make your game challenging, checkpoints can help serve you in that arena as well. It's also worth noting, I don't have a slide for this, but if people aren't getting to the end because your game is too difficult, maybe consider the kind of game you're making. Uh, if your game hinges on an excellent end cutscene, it might be worth making sure your game is easy enough for all players to make it to the end or provide a way for players to skip difficult parts if you really want them to make it all the way to the end. Because unless your game is truly special, a lot of players, once they retry an area far too many times, they'll simply move on instead of sticking around for the potential, potential hours it might take for them to beat your game. And finally, and honestly one of my favorite tips in this talk, they just, they just didn't know that the end was near. Um, something that I do all the time when I'm rating jam games is I'll play for 20 minutes even. Uh, decide that I've seen enough. I think maybe the game's infinite, like there's endless levels. And so I say, okay, that's all, that's all I have the energy for. I'm going to go ahead and rate the game. And then I rate the game and I leave my comment. And I decide to scroll through the other comments people gave thinking, well, I, maybe I didn't get all the way through, but at least I got up to level nine. Um, and then all the comments are like, oh my God, the ending at the end of level 10, really, it, it changed everything. And this is particularly frustrating because I, I simply didn't know I was that close to finishing. Oftentimes when this happens to me, it, I end up doing a sort of frustrated speed run of the game, just so I can see this incredible ending that everyone's talking about. And often... 
the ending doesn't quite live up to those expectations. It's just not the play experience you want the player to be coming off of when they get to your your fancy cinematic ending. Now, there's, again, a few different ways to resolve this issue. The more difficult but really, really nice way to do it is to integrate it into your world or story. Um, that's It's very effective when it's pulled off well. Excuse me. Um, it can help avoid UI clutter, but it, it can be difficult to implement, especially into a pre-existing game. And, and I mean this not necessarily in terms of code, just in terms of game design. It can be difficult to add this kind of mechanic. I think one of my favorite examples ever of this is the video game Journey by uh, that game company. In Journey, you spend the whole game traveling towards this mountain that has a light at its peak. You're trying to, to get to the top of that mountain. And it's, it's visible for the entire time you're playing the game. Basically, I mean, <laughs> uh, there's a few sections, I think, where you go into a hallway. But as you play the game, you can see that mountaintop coming closer and closer. And that has the effect of really giving you a good idea as to how close you are to the end. It really allows you to understand how large the game is when you see that the mountain has gotten or you've traversed half the distance between you where you were originally and to the mountain. You know you're roughly halfway through the game. Perhaps though, you're thinking, no, nah, that doesn't work for my game. It's my game takes place in in the tunnels or something like that. Well, you could also give them like a literal progress meter. It's usually a little bit easier to implement, but, or I should say as well, it, it gives you really crystal clear communication as to how far the, the end is. In my game Aviarium, I think I, I give the most explicit example of this that I've ever given, which is that in the bottom right hand corner of the game, there's a text element that shows the percentage of the game the player has completed. It's always there. It starts out saying 0% complete. Each time they complete a little mission, it goes up a little bit. I think it's like by like 8% each little section. Um, and once they finish the end sequence of the game, it says 100% complete. And then they're set free in the game world to fly around as much as they'd like. Uh, it's honestly hard for me to think of a game design decision that I've gotten as much positive feedback on as this 100% complete meter. Um, I had lots of comments on that game of people saying that they barely even noticed the missions until they saw that it said 0% complete. And then they realized that there was things to do in this game and that it really shepherded, shepherded them along from the beginning of the game to the end. And it, it really helped make sure that they got all the way there. If your game isn't mission-based, it doesn't have to be a, a text element that says 0 to 100% complete. Um, it could be a progress bar on the top of the screen. You could just simply measure the player's position on the Z axis as they travel along it, or whatever axis they travel along in your game. Note where the end is. Note where the beginning is. Do a little bit of math, and then you figured out how far the player is from the end of the game. Either way. Putting the end in sight can be pivotal to getting people to the end. Um, and it can really keep people from dipping out just because they think they've seen everything your game has to offer. So if the player knew, if the player avoided getting stuck and they knew where the end was, you really, you just have to reel them in from here. They've made it to the end. Um, and if you've made it to this point and people still aren't finishing your game, it's you, you have to really consider that there might be a deeper issue here. Many of these other things are essentially band-aids for problems. These next two things are a little bit more core to your design. Quite simply, sometimes your game could be too boring. And 
that might sound harsh, but let me explain a little bit about what I mean by that. When I say that the game could be too boring, what I'm not saying you need to do is simply make your game more exciting by adding more drama or more of anything, really. I think the best way to keep a game from being too boring is to avoid watering down your content. I think the best jam games and really reasonably short games of all kinds are best received when they leave people wanting more. Um, if people play through two thirds of your game and say, I've seen enough, when they get to the rating section, they're coming off of having to decide to stop playing the game because they, they, they thought it had overstayed its welcome. But if you are harsh on the, in the cutting room and you make sure that you only keep the best content, people might come off the end of your game thinking, oh my God, I want more of this. I might play this game again just to experience the content I already experienced. I would say give them four amazing levels instead of 20 decent levels. That'll always be better. Um, because again, players have potentially unlimited games to rate. So in the situation of jam games, it's not going to be a situation where they finish your game and they're like, oh man, I sure wish that game was way longer so that I couldn't I wouldn't already be moving on to something else. If you leave them wanting more, they'll come off of it feeling like it was a really incredible entry. Uh, and they might even look forward to seeing more from you or ask you to expand the game so they can play it when they're not trying to rate a million games in one sitting. Now, finally, it's quite possible that the game is just too long. Sometimes I'll play a jam game that's that's fun and it's not even boring. Like the content is all pretty good. But there's just too much of it. Like I just can't finish it. Like sometimes people manage to churn out two hours of decent content over a game jam. And that's good and all. And it's really impressive to see someone turn out that much content. But again, because of the situation with jam games, people have endless games to rate. And you really can't ask a jam raider to play your game for two hours. That's, that's a big ask. I think what I try to do is I try to keep my game to 15 minutes or less emphasis on less here. If you're thinking, uh, I've got five great minutes of gameplay, but maybe I should add some more to hit that 15 minutes figure. I, this, this rule isn't for you. But if you're at 45 minutes and you're like, hmm, do I need to cut something? If you'd like people to see all of your content, almost certainly, yes, you should cut it down a little bit. Cut the worst parts, keep the best parts. It'll make your game better overall. Another important thing to note, and this is a pitfall that I fell into a lot personally in my early jam days, is I would target my game being 10 to 15 minutes, and I would try and build a game that took me 10 to 15 minutes to beat. Now, <laughs> some of you might already see the pitfalls here. If a developer takes 10 to 15 minutes to beat, especially for a skill-based video game, it could take a player hours to beat the game. So I usually try to follow a one to three rule. If I can speed run my game in five minutes or less, that means that for a brand new player, it will probably be roughly 15 minutes or so. And sometimes even with that rule, I'm surprised. With my recent game, Aquarial, the fish game, I estimated that I would have about 12 minutes of content because I had about four minutes per Let's Play that I would do to test out the game. And I was surprised to find that uh, many people 
perhaps because of the dialogue, really took their time with it. And I found that for most people, it's really closer to 15 to 20 minutes. I think the most common time that I've seen is about 18 minutes to beat the game, uh, especially for people who've recorded videos. I think perhaps because they talk a lot over the game. Either way, it's a, a, a good lesson in how easy it can be to underestimate how long it takes to beat your game. And again, you know, try to keep it to 15 minutes or less. If you can, make it even shorter. Some of my favorite jam games have been three minutes long, but they were really, really good for those three minutes. Uh, well, this is thank you, but I actually have a few more things to say, so I'm going to go back to the slide. Uh, the last thing I'll say is it's also important to remember that grades aren't everything here. Um, these rules are designed to help players finish your jam game, but that doesn't necessarily mean that all of these are rules for good game design, especially good game design outside of a game jam context. So I think, as they often say in art, you need to know the rules to break them. The same applies here for this. If you ever think that your design will truly be stronger by avoiding these rules, I think you should absolutely break them. Um, because it's also important to remember that these rules help prevent situations that push players away from your story, from your game. But even if there's nothing actively pushing them away, they may still decide that they're simply not interested and, and stop playing. Um, so it's really important to remember what you want people to finish the game for. Like, what is, what's the story you're trying to tell? If you can avoid these these pitfalls and get your story across in a reasonable amount of time, I think uh, most players, at least the ones that matter, will make it all the way to the end. Yeah, now now thank you. Uh, if you have any, well, well, we'll do some questions here, but if you have any questions later, I think you should absolutely hit up the Aesthetician Labs Discord. I'm very accessible there at me anytime. It's at aesthetic.game slash discord. Uh, I'd be remiss to mention that you can find all of the games that I made that I mentioned in this um, at my itch page, aidenmarkham.itch.io. And uh, also, this presentation kind of has a, a blog post counterpart that's available at uh, the Aesthetic Aesthetician Labs blog. Uh, that URL is long. I'm not going to read it out. Just go to aesthetic.game slash blog. It's the top post there. And yeah, if we've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But that's really all I've got. For this presentation. Awesome. Thank you, Aiden. I do have a couple of questions that I want to ask as people start to drop those in chat. Yeah, sure. Um, first one being which of your previous jam game games do you think breaks the most of these rules? And was that because of like a lack of experience as you were still learning, or was that an intentional design break? That's a really good question. Um I think. Almost none of my games follow all of these rules. I think, actually, Aviarium, the bird game, is the game that comes the closest to following, following all of them. Even in Aquarial, my most recent one, I was well-versed in understanding that players need to know that the end is in sight. Uh, but there's really not an end in sight in that game, other than the fact that there's a limited game level. So the players kind of know that there's not too far that they're going to have to go. Um, but thinking back to some games, um, a game that I'm famously hard on for myself, Astray, breaks a lot of these rules. Um, I think that game is much longer than it needs to be. Uh, I could have trimmed that game down to half the length and it would have been stronger. It's quite easy to lose. Uh, so it usually takes people multiple tries of a 15 minute game to get through, making it even longer than it is on its lonesome. Uh, and also that game, all the controls are just on the game page. There's no controls text there or anything. Um, amazing soundtrack from Rowan Waring on that one, though. Awesome. And you said Aviarium, you think was kind of your best example and that people can find that on your itch page. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, awesome. No Thank you questions. so much. Yeah, we'll give it another you know minute or so. If you've got any questions, frantically type them in chat. Frantically, um, yeah. I actually have a, a quick little bonus round that I can run through here. 
Uh, these are not related to helping players finish your game. But while I've got the soapbox here, I need to like get these off my chest. Get on it. Everyone, please don't name your game build after the jam. Every time I'm grading for Ludum Dar, I end up with a million folders called LD48.zip. Like, your game has a title, presumably. Just name it the game's <laughs> title. It's it's that easy. <laughs> yeah, everyone won't be having, like, can't unzip. This this folder already exists issues constantly. And uh, also leave some time for presentation. Like, I think some people are, are definitely liable to, like, be pushing that build down to the last hour. And then they just pop it right up. But I see so many situations where really just some nice screenshots on the game page, a slightly nicer itch page would go a long way to getting some really cool projects out there in front of way more people's eyes. Yeah, that's my bonus round. It seems like we have too many questions, which I, I kind of understand. Uh, this is a little bit less technical, so just a little less uh, sort of technicalities. Uh, so I guess the last thing I'll say is, I should put it at the end, I'm going to go all the way back to the top as a quick reminder at the end of this video that if you want to look at these slides, maybe you're doing a game jam in the future and you want to be reminded, uh, you can find this presentation, which will link out to everything else at bit.ly slash game finish workshop. People can find you on Discord. That's the yep. best place. Discord's probably the best place. Yeah, aesthetic.game slash Discord. You can get me at Instagram as well if you want to hit me up on social media. Mark Ham Aiden is my Instagram. That's probably the best social to get me at. Um, but yeah, if you want to talk to me, hit up that Aesthetician Labs Discord. Heck yeah. Uh, with that, seems like we don't really have any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Aiden. That's great. Uh, we'll sign off for the night. Have a good month, everyone. Uh, we will not be having a workshop in August, so we will see you all in September, unless you join us for another one of the Rock Game Dev events. Uh, have a good one, everyone. Night, y'all.